I would uh, first like to remind us that uh, we are on unceded lands of the First Nations, particularly the Mi'kmaq Nation. The title of my conference is From L'Acadie, L'Acadie, From Rurality to Urbanity. Uh, it's a fact that uh, arts and cultures are an urban uh, more than rural phenomenon. Obviously, it's sure that the production can happen elsewhere and the promotion because of the uh, IT can be at a click, but it's still better to count on a population uh, where the cities are favored. Will always be during the summer, for example, to go to uh, the countryside to participate in uh, festivals, uh, events, but it still remains that it's in the cities that we have the necessary establishments for the regrouping, uh, for the interest of the cultural sector. Uh, the quality is uh, there, and the culture that uh, is unique to this. Uh, community and to develop and to consolidate an identity that was very fragile but it, which is more and more uh, defined uh, is grateful for this uh, life. We can realize that Acadie did not create big cities but uh, maybe a series of prosperous villages uh, with a great future uh, except for the uh, 1755 deportation that uh, destroyed basically uh, everything uh, that existed. Uh, they've disappeared from the maps. They were spread around the whole world. Uh, but uh, Canadians uh, have had this dream to come back on a territory that was already set up by the conquerors. This is where there were many problems. Uh, uh, they didn't have any resources, but they came back on their former lands or they uh, hid in forests. They started to found new villages where they started once again to take back their territory. Their world is, the world is going to be a rural one, confined, confirmed in an identity whose language and religion became their, the pillars the cities were seen as uh, a sinful for the language, but also for faith, uh, following the slogan, who, one who loses one's language loses uh, one's life. So we developed a mentality of uh, resistance, of uh, fight, uh, of survival to uh, defend our uh, life. Uh, Things are getting better, but there was a, a crisis. There was a, we were looking for a social project in which we could get together around language and religion. This rurality is one of the major reasons that Acadie is a place where art will be absent for a long time. Yes, in villages there were some uh, fiddlers, uh, some uh, poets, some painters, some uh, rug hookers, uh, uh, and uh, narrators or storytellers, but they were subject to censor uh, due to the religion. I mean, uh, there was temptation everywhere that was going to pervert the people. So there are, therefore, few of the artists and their authentic creations uh, make us think that art and culture are not a luxury but a necessity. On the Anglophone side, it's going to be very different. Very early, we decided to build cities, uh, the importance of which uh, was crucial. The Acadians, they will be fishermen because they didn't have access to their lands. Uh, uh, for a long time, the concept of uh, the urban aspect uh, is always something that's kind of nebulous, unclear, where educators, uh, the plant owners, the teachers, and these big houses where they come to work as uh, uh, char people. Uh, in these uh, cities, which are uh, mostly uh, Anglophone, Moncton, Halifax, who actually is celebrating its 275th anniversary, 
St. John, Fredericton. There's also an interest for culture that we see. Uh, people bring things back from travels elsewhere, but we can start seeing things here also in 1894, the University of Mount Allison in Sackville will be opening what will become the first uh, uh, visual arts department in Canada. The Acadians also will found institutions of high learning, but these colleges will be in rural committees like Caraquet, Saint Louis, Memram Cook, or Pointe à l'Église. We'll have to wait for 1963 to see the opening of the University of Moncton, where culture has an important place uh, because it constitutes an essential part of our identity. Progress, development will be important for this city that became the cultural capital of Acadie. Uh, there will be tension, and we still remember here the tension where the colonial privileges were kind of confronted with the new ideas, especially the new Acadian culture that was affirming itself for the first time on the public uh, space. The 60s in Acadie will be, uh, we'll see the uh, Louis Girobicio's election, who became the premier of New Brunswick and who will launch a program. Uh, equal chance for everybody that will give their chance to the Acadians. The University of Moncton is part of this uh, reform movement that will touch all domains, but specifically education. Robichaud will say himself that uh, it's a university is something maybe that what the best thing that he he's had accomplished uh, in his term from 60 to 70. Uh, ten years that will mark the uh, Western culture. Acadie uh, not being an exception in this. The importance of the University of Moncton will be crucial because from this mother institutional we will see uh, theater shops, uh, art galleries or music groups uh, basically set up in Moncton but they'll be shining uh, everywhere on the territory. The creation of arts, faculties, visual arts, uh, music, uh, dramatic arts is not going to be foreign to this. Uh, it was a brutal awakening and a, a will for Lacadie to uh, be in the century modern and to generate exportable uh, works in this there'll be different strategies to link the works of rurality or of tradition to modernity the work of Antonine Maria prolific and uh, also the uh, award winner of Goncourt Prize will be the bridge between tradition and literary uh, working with a language that's typical of Acadie uh, inspiration of storytellers we can talk about a oral literature to an, a written literature she also uh, lived and uh, published her work elsewhere than in Acadie. Uh, that's something that will happen with other artists basically in Quebec who uh, also gave an idea that was traditional of what Acadie was but we have to see also the possibility of working with uh, bigger uh, urban centers at a time when there was no infrastructure, in other words, no theater houses or uh, publishers or arts houses that would be able to promote the creations of the artists. These artists uh, often gave uh, uh, ideal image uh, and something that we're moving away from more and more because we know that art now is part of a modern planetary culture of urbanity. The University of Moncton would give to the city uh, a profile that gave it a leadership role so that it's a, a cultural capital of l'Acadie. Because of all the talents, ideas coming from the university, whose name has always been a problem. We know that Winslow and Lawrence, that Moncton was one of the artisans of the uh, Grand Dérangement. But we don't want to be part of uh, renaming of the territory, but there is an intention, and Gérald Leblanc said uh, that it was necessary for him to write because Moncton, for him, was the extreme border of the Acadian territory. The notion of territory is a notion uh, also that is 
a paradox. Uh, the geographic Acadie has disappeared more than two centuries ago, but it still remains the, the, the earth, the land here, and our presence is here, maybe less than the uh, First Nations who have the deep conscience of this earth where we gather. But our presence of over more than 400 years has given us roots, and because of that, artists have chosen to live here, to build a work that more and more uh, speaks to people and f from here. We were for a long time in our rural aspects, but more and more now we go towards uh, urban axes. This movement is not something new and it's not just ours, but like the song of the Hey Babies, who is going to ring the bells of the village? Because the danger is big to get lost in an urban culture where Americanism is not far away. How to create an urban culture that would consider this rural aspect from where we come? It seems an ambitious goal, but it's a, a will of the fusion between tradition and modernity. This is where we create a new culture. It's by having access to uh, things that the blacks in America were able to create this culture in the United States, and it was good for the United States. Now it's our turn as Acadians. As Acadians, we have to reinvent ourselves in this urbanity. We have to create our urban soul. This uh, fusion between tradition and modernity has already started, but like everywhere else, the danger is enormous to maybe see ourselves swallowed up by the United States uh, culture. Because of these accomplishments in different domains, this culture has created something that is very seductive, food, music, business, um, IT, and our culture is part of this seduction that uh, shows us uh, fantastic uh, illusions of awards. Uh, we know that uh, few reach those levels. In Moncton, we have this fusion of the uh, French-speaking, English-speaking that resulted in chiac that is criticized by some and recognized by others as something representing a border. This presence of Anglophones here are in other parts of culture, and it's an important part of urbanity. Even if chiac exists and it, for a long time, we have to say that it's just recently that it's becoming something that's uh, part of urbanity. Uh, it's basically presenting something that's newer, younger, that's liberated from what was the past of losing one's faith or somebody who loses his language and his faith loses in culture. Okay, we have to see what the result is going to be. The French language, uh, regardless of its complexity, its involution, gives us the opportunity to brown around the world. And in that sense, it keeps its keeps on being seductive and it uh, carries a culture of humanity. Uh, to move away from this would be an error and a great loss. So we have to hope that the presence of Chiac uh, is going to be put back in the context, a little bit like Joal in Quebec, and that it become a language among others and not just the only reference of Acadian culture. L'Acadie finds itself therefore at a crossroads, like all the smaller cultures. It could be swept away at any time, but we have to see that this identity has already gone through many challenges that have given it a, a, a will. Future is to come, and we'll see, but uh, this future will have to be within urbanity, and uh, we have to be conscious of this urbanity, and we know that it'll have to be It'll have to change to give us the opportunity to participate in the development where we'll be able to continue on the road that has been around for more than 400 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chasson. You know, he was Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick 
from 2003 to 2009. He's a great artist, a great author, and you can look at the Grandos uh, kiosk at the back. Some of his works, some of his books can be seen just outside the conference hall. So thank you very much. And you know, Mr. Chiasson spoke of the challenges, you know, linguistic tensions in the past in Moncton. This was a difficult era, but he contributed to lessen these tensions. So the former mayor of the city of Moncton, Mr. Brian Murphy, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to speak at this conference. I see Her Worship is here, the mayor from Dieppe. The real mayor of Dieppe? I don't know. My colleagues from Louisiana, member right from the legislature. Manic Leblanc and council members from the city of uh, Terrio, Mrs. Edget and Terrio, and all the members and delegates from this network. The organizers of this event, and I know that they're running behind time, so you'll be happy to know that I crossed off a number of the jokes that my wife did not find funny this morning. <laughs> so, crimp the time a bit. Um, I'm a Francophile. I'm here to show the importance of having not only Francophones within this area, but also Anglophones and people who like to live and to speak French and those who are Francophiles. And we're here to commemorate the Francophone Summit. This was in 1999 that we had the summit here. In on those times, we have some personal memories that are pretty profound and pretty happy ones. We had uh, just been married about six years. We had three young children. We were asked with a very young Premier Bernard Lord and his wife Diane to go to the Moncton Airport, as it was called then, uh, in Dieppe. The Moncton Airport's in Dieppe, just so your people from away are more confused, that's fine. <clears throat> but there was a kind of a warm joke circulating when you went to the airport and you met Jacques Chirac and Prince Albert of Monaco and the hands were extended that the ladies who were with us, who had their hands kissed, didn't wash for a week during that time. It was so elegant. Uh, we were starstruck. There were wonderful times. And in the sense... And with our sense of humor as Acadians, or Acadian by adoption, we gave nicknames to some well-known people. Like at that time, we had uh, the General Secretary of the United Nations, Boutros, Boutros Gheli. It's not really an Acadian name. So at that time, he was named Boudreau, Boudreau Gala. <laughs> That was his nickname for the Moncton. The greatest opportunity in the Francophonie was this. The summit gave us, uh, put us on the map in the Francophone world. So Moncton, you know, it was introducing Moncton to the world. But for me, for me, what was most important is to have the, the majority of residents who here in Moncton are Anglophones to see how we appreciate francophones in the greater Moncton area. I was, I went through immersion courses and I continue to learn French through immersion classes. And there are many people like me, Anglophones, who learn French later on in life and really like the francophone culture who are francophiles. So before the Francophone Summit, 
There wasn't much that showed Francophiles or to the Anglophone majority what it is to be a Francophone or a French speaker in the world and living in French, you know. Ninety-nine. that the majority of the population in this community who came out to see the heads of state, who uh, saw the various act public activities, saw the international press that came to little old Moncton, and enjoyed the long Uh, standing and uh, remaining cultural and ac architectural legacies of the event, it wasn't clear to them that there was a great deal to being part of La Francophonie. And so not only enjoying the social, cultural, and political importance of the event, what also happened, the transformation in my view, was that everyone saw there was always, and it will always be, a very economic important tool to being a francophilic, a francophone uh, community. A partir de ce moment, ministre. From that time in 1999, I can tell you, signage, explanation, recruitment campaigns. I hope. Is that important? <laughs> So from that time in 1999, a lot of advertising. It changed things, you know? It was in French then. We have here. We have a well-known furniture store owned by Anglophones. From that time, they'll change their business plan. They'll do a advertising campaigns in both languages and yeah, advertising in both languages and not only to be a good citizen but to attract francophones and anglophones it's a question of money it's positive for the economy as i said there are many people like me who want to practice their french it's a good thing to have signage in french and see the commercial aspect in French also. Sure. That's in a general sense, but quite literally, because my wife is a Francophone and my daughters are half Irish and half Acadian. By the way, that means that they celebrate Kanzu and St. Patrick's Day more than Christmas and Thanksgiving. But in this town, whether it's Dieppe, Riverview, Moncton, or the greater region uh, of Kent County and so on, it's a great honor and joy to hear the mix of French and English in our city. Uh, it's unique for a small city like ours to, to seem so cosmopolitan. Now, in Canada, there's quite a little standing joke or a standing gag to make fun of Toronto. Sorry for anybody who's from Toronto. I guess there probably wouldn't be too many, so that's why I chose this joke. But people, you know, we prefer, down here, we prefer a place like Montreal. It's cool. It's good. You know, I have two daughters there. They, they like it much more than, than, than Toronto. But So the joke goes, as we bash Toronto, how many Torontonians does it take to change a light bulb? It's two, one to change the light bulb, and the other person to call New York to see how it's done. <laughs> During Les Sommets de la Francophonie, they were, the press was saying, well, Mon Moncton has this feel. It's like Montreal Léger, Montreal Light. And we sure like that appellation. We like that a lot. Sorry, Toronto. La prochaine conférence. The next speaker will talk about the situation here and talk about the future. In my opinion, as Hermine Gilles said, this transformation where people now appreciate francophones started way before the summit. The summit is the end of that accomplishment. But I'm talking about Moncton and the, the later 19th century to the 20th, the 20th century, where Acadia survived various challenges. And that's part of, you know, the city becoming officially bilingual and the summit. These are two elements which we can pinpoint as key moments, but it started way before. For instance, in 1955, in 1755 there's a deportation, yes, but the return of Acadians. 
not all the Acadians. Asian friends here who didn't come back, but good for you, you've put your imprint on the world. But for the Acadians who came back and made a nation, there were some decisions to make. Le chemin qui a conduit... The road that led to those accomplishments, surviving, survival, and succeeding, for Acadians to succeed, it started with things like the creation of their Acadian flag, the creation of the, move, the Acadian movement. During the Francophonie Summit in 1999, in an interview on TV5, the author, Antonin Maillet, explained, explained that by accepting Moncton as the name of its city and its university, University of Moncton. Obviously, that's the capital of, of Francophones in uh, Acadia. Sorry, Mayor of Dieppe, but it's in Moncton. And University of Moncton is a higher learning institution. At that time, Acadians accepted its success and forgot the idea of, uh, you know, by by looking for a new name, no. Chosen to change the name of the city of Moncton or to adopt a different name for the University of Moncton. But as Antonin Maillet explained, Acadians had already defeated the English forces of expulsion. That they survived it, and beca it became their motto to survive and to accommodate and to get along by accepting the Moncton name is a credit not to the survival of English imperialism, but to the generosity, strength, and confidence of the Acadian people. Fast forward in the 1960s and 70s, uh, movements occurred all over the world in the furtherance of legal, linguistic, and human rights. So on the streets of San Francisco, New York, or on the bog side of Derry, Ireland, there were movements, there were rights movements, no different here. This culminated with a group from the University of Moncton who visited City Hall, the City Hall that our members here, it's a different building, but anyway, the institution, and they demanded to, be, to address council in the French language. And they were refused. They were not allowed to speak French in the 1960s in Moncton. That summer ended with the dumping of a pig's head on the lawn of the obstinate English language only mayor of Moncton, Leonard Jones. When I thought about what I might say here today, I thought, well, isn't it time that someone apologized and said that behavior was really awful? So, Mayor Jones, and he led a council, but Mayor Jones, he was bigoted and he was wrong and he denied language rights to so many. It has to be said. It's a long time after it happened. Je ne suis plus maire. I'm no longer the mayor of the city. I'm no longer active in politics. But I'd like to share this. Mayor Jones was not alone. He was reelected five times. In other words, many voters voted for him. For that reason, and we're closing your eyes on the principle of linguistic rights, the, the Anglophone majority made some inexcusable actions. In the past, at that time, it was okay to have Acadians, to have them as uh, housekeepers, working instead of lawyers and nurses and doctors and teachers as the case today. So on this, on behalf of the majority of the Anglophone majority, I'd like to apologize for that situation. That situation should have been corrected much earlier. Francophonie, we did make some headway, some headway. I am relatively young. I'm the same age as Barack Obama, and I'm not quite done yet. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but I remember a time in 1992 when I started 
on council when you could smoke at inside council meetings and on airplanes, but you couldn't get a glass of liquor on the outdoor cafes of, in Moncton. So that's where we are, just remember. But I remember being in meetings when phrases like this, and they, they just have to be said, they have to be recounted. We were talking about first responders, fire departments, and whether there should be bi bilingual services. I mean, it seems so silly to be even discussing it today. But there were statements like, well, fire don't speak no language, really. And fake tolerance statements like, I'm not against bilingualism. I just want to make sure the best candidate is chosen, really. These expressions were usually coupled with expressions like, I've got nothing against Acadians, some of my best friends are Acadians. I lived that transformation. I was there. I heard these phrases. I was a little younger, so I didn't understand, you know, in the street that I grew up, French, English, people spoke both languages poorly maybe, I don't know, there's some reference to Shaq, my French is terrible, you know, it's Moncton. But that was my Moncton. And what I heard many times was not the Moncton I wanted Moncton to be. So, heureusement, cette époque est So this is past. There's acceptation and promotion took place. And the Francophone Summit played an essential role. Also, again, there are many people like me, Francophiles, immersion students, that worked to make sure that bilingualism was accepted at my time when I was young with sitting on council. All frontline services were bilingual. So it wasn't perfect. But there was movement. And the city recruited its first bilingual clerk and we had the first Acadian becoming fire chief. And finally, we had an Acadian mayor, the first Acadian mayor in 19, yes, 1985, Leopold Bellivou. He was elected not once, but twice. Evening in August of 2002, by unanimous vote, the city of Moncton declared itself officially bilingual, the first in Canada in law and in fact. <laughs> it was an enormous statement made so many generations after it should have been. And it was met with acceptance, jubilation by many, but it merely codified or stated what the state is or ought to have been for the state of affairs in the city at the time. And there's been so much improvement. I look over to city staff and so much improvement since that time. Madam Mayor and your staff have done so much on a continuing basis, not just to make it something that's written and made press story, but to actively work to change the way we deliver services and allow people to work in their choice of, choice of language. I often say to my English colleagues that Francophones are not afraid to make errors in English. It's the only way to learn. I spoke some French today, you know, it wasn't perfect. But we should try. In a, a town like Moncton, it's pretty easy to do that. It's pretty easy to order coffee in French, right? So do it. So we should speak, warts and all, as much as we can in French and English. And things have changed so much. When I started my linguistic training in schools in 1975 or so, they adopted the, mo the Parisian model the first sentence that I remember was <laughs> Pierre Enebitay lives in the 18th arrondissement with a little doggy called Tutu. <laughs> Today's immersion is a bit more down to earth. And I think we can see, you know, a caddy man, we can see the local culture. And also because in my life, I never recognized, I've never seen a dog called Tutu in Acadia. Do you have, have you ever seen such a thing? I don't know. That acceptance of language means acceptance of people. Language is the prime method by which people communicate. If you choose not to embrace another language which is significant by number or culture in your community, 
You are choosing to build a wall between populations, which is unacceptable. Language and the promotion of culture attendant to the language only makes us all richer. It's been that way in Moncton and may it always be so for all of our communities and the world. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. I think you'll see this, dear guest, Brian Murphy, is a proud Francophile. He's a friend of Francophones. Today, Francophones and Francophiles are welcome in our communities, and they have their role to play within communities. There are many of them that are f facing specific challenges like linguistic insecurity or Linguistic security. Our next guest will talk about the future of uh, the future of youth. So, let's welcome Madame Sodugay. She is president of the Youth Francophone Association. Good morning, everyone. So, already, I like the way I was introduced with security, linguistic security. Well, to start with, I'll set the stage by saying that people of my age coming come from a society that had two laws, two acts when it comes to official languages. They had linguistic rights. I'm also a product of a bilingual municipality. That means I always had the opportunity, always, I should say, to say thank you when you give me a coffee and say bonjour in French, to order in French, it depends. Sometimes chiac would kick in and I would ask for a double-double, but otherwise, yeah, it worked out great. When we talk about linguistic security, what does it mean? What it means what for today's youth when we talk about the Francophonie? What does it mean for French-speaking youths? It means that we're more inclusive. We're not talking about Francophones or Francophonie. We're talking about people who can express themselves in French. In a modern context, when we talk about an evolving society, evolving daily, and we see, and we've seen over the last century, that things are moving very quickly. Societies, majority populations in a society can grow at that speed, and a minority must also evolve as quickly as others, simply because we have to survive also. So when we talk about speaking French, we don't divide people between Francophones and Francophiles or friends of the Francophonie. You have a room like any other Francophone in what is the Francophonie. So we recognize that even though we're learning French later on in life, I like Mr. Murphy, I like. I think you're. I think you're a francophone, not a francophile, because you can express yourself in French. We saw this, and you're very, you're very aware of the culture. We also see within our network, within the Feder the Youth uh, Federation of Francophones, a lot of young people identify themselves as bilingual. Some, some francophones are worried about this, but, but I'll remind you that we are a product of a society where there was an act on official languages, where there were two acts on official, act, uh, official languages in Brunswick. We have municipalities that allow us to express ourselves in either official languages in Canada. So a bilingual identity is the last thing, according to us, in my opinion, in the federation that we should fear, really. Bilingualism for me is a sign of strength. It's a sign that we can keep our Francophonie I can be proud to be an Acadian or Francophone, but also I can be proud of being bilingual also. Why not be proud? Well, I was told that it was not a culture in itself. It's not something. There's nothing tied to bilingualism, but quite the opposite. My generation today has a bilingual culture. We come from, you know, pa our parents are, one is Francophone, the other one is Anglophone, and we live in homes where both languages are spoken, or even three languages or more, because 
we, we favor linguistic diversity. So when we talk about bilingualism as an identity, it means in a minority setting, for, for, as Francophones, that we don't forget the fact that we're Francophones. We don't forget that there's some people who fought who struggled before us so that we could identify ourselves as bilingual individuals. That means we recognize that some people, like Mr. Amélie Gilles Chasson, gave me uh, awards when I was very young for poems that I was writing in Miramichi, where there, it's an English-speaking city, but there is a strong Francophone community living in Miramichi. And it may seem banal and commonplace, and I'm just doing some name dropping when I talk about Mr. Chasson, but no, it's things like that, recognizing francophones, by people who are bilingual, and I don't like the expression, but I can't think of another way of saying it to make it uh, legitimate. So a lieutenant governor came to see me at my school at the Café Beauceret in Miramichi, at the library, to serve the francophone community because youth and immersion had access to that library, the public library, and it was the lieutenant governor who came and gave me an award. So when we talk about a modern Acadia, when we talk about modern French-speaking communities, for me, we're talking about seeing more in a world where we live and we see the globalization. We want to accept people when we're talking about Linguistic differences, we're talking about accepting linguistic realities. Mr. Murphy said that we accept an individual, we accept people as they are. That's what it is to be a Francophone today. That's what it is to be a Francophone in my community. We're part of something that is greater. So when we're talking about militants, Francophone militants, in 2019, what does it mean? Well, a militant who is a Francophone who's 20 years old, for instance, that means a young person who believes in the environment also. That person also believes in bilingualism. But that doesn't mean that we believe less in the Francophonie. It doesn't mean that we believe less in policies and rights for Francophones and Anglophones. That means the social sphere should give us some room as bilingual individuals. When we're talking about, we like to talk about men and women and boxes. When we talk about languages in Canada, we like to say French or English, but it's more than that. And I think this generation, that's our vision, not to be afraid to lose your language because we have institutions, strong institutions. We have laws in place and policies that have been implemented to guarantee our linguistic rights. We're talking about modernizing the Official Languages Act in Canada. That's essential because I have to be able to grow as a bilingual individual or polyglot, regardless of the number of languages I want to speak, without fearing of losing my Francophone identity, without losing the resources that I have as an Acadian person. Alors, quand so when we're talking about linguistic modern topics in the Francophonie, we quickly see that this generation, perhaps differently from others, and I shouldn't say this, just this generation, but we're tackling this one. We're lost between these boxes because these boxes are very close. How can we find our place in a society when we're told that our French is not good enough, when we're told that our English is not good enough. But I, am, I did not grow up speaking in English, so the English community where I come from, they don't necessarily accept me as an Anglophone, yet, si je parle en français, puis on... But if I speak French and they criticize the way of speaking French for a person that grew up in a French-speaking household, it's almost impossible to find a, a place within society. How can I find my place, my way, when people before me or the people around me create these boxes and we are in between those two boxes? And there's not much room between those two set boxes. There's no way for us to resolve all these issues. The solution is to set aside these boxes. 
without losing what we already have. We have rights as Francophones, we have rights, linguistic rights. That again, and I would point out that nothing is, uh, nothing is forever. We are aware of this. As a minority, there will always be a struggle. Having said so, when we have infrastructure that are strong to guarantee our rights, and they promise that tomorrow we'll have as many rights as today, that's what allow us to grow as individuals and to go back to the globalization issue when we when we see various political situations like today. The reality today is that now not all human beings have the same opportunities on earth and I'm talking about uh, personally I'm very aware that that I'm very lucky compared to others but I have challenges compared to others also. So being a francophone in 2019, it means I will not only struggle, but I don't like the word fight, but I won't only work on this bilingualism issue. I want to do more because my identity is not just defined by Sim being a, you know, a woman, Acadian, bilingual. I'm much more than that. We're part of something that's much bigger than ourselves, bigger than our identity. And if we can transcend this, if we can have communities, municipalities that protect us, that guarantee a way for us not to lose what we we are, like as Francophones, if everything's in place, well, then I can keep my identity. But at the same time, I can work and change what's not working well elsewhere or around me in various ways. But then we go even further as a minority, yes, but this minority, linguistic minority, Francophone community is much greater. We're part of something that's much bigger. So if we always limit ourselves to, you know, the fact that a minority is just exotic, we won't be able to do what a majority can accomplish. So yes, I'll continue to work and we'll continue to be militants on linguistic issues, but we'll work also on other issues and we shouldn't be afraid of that. I like to share my experience when I have to speak to people. I, my family comes from the Acadian Peninsula in New Brunswick, so I am typically Acadian, even though I hate that expression. But I come from an Acadian family, half Irish and half Acadian, so I celebrate the 15th of August and the um, St. Patrick more than the Christmas, really. But we, my family moved to Miramichi, and I talked about Miramichi earlier. That's an English-speaking city, but with a strong French-speaking community. And over the last few years also, the Francophone community played a key role, and we see we were inspired by what's taking place elsewhere. A synergy was taking place between both linguistic community. And I'm saying all this, I was younger when I was growing up, I came from a French speaking home. I went to a French school where I had access to a French speaking community center. So that means all my services were in French as a young child. So I didn't need anything else. So I grew up in a French island. I was not aware that I was a minority and I was not aware that there were other people in other regions that didn't even have access to education in French. I saw young, I saw children from kindergarten who are my friends who had two English speaking parents and no Francophone parents. That means these young people they didn't have, uh, they weren't ayant droit, they weren't uh, entitled and in, in in Canada, those who have those rights uh, in minority setting, they have, um, if they have French speaking parents, they have the right to send their children to school in French. Then we went from kindergarten to grade 12, but it's around grade six that I realized that it wasn't common what I was experiencing. It was very rare, in fact, that most of the time people were being divided, you know, francophones and anglophones were often divided in other municipalities and regions. And I'm saying all this because these young people, my friends, were growing up in an environment where they went back home 
And they spoke English because naturally, you know, if both parents speak English, we'll communicate with them in a common language so that everyone can grow and understand each other. But the majority of my friends right now go to the University of Moncton, which is a French-speaking institution because there's a system that believed in them that redefined what it was a, to be a Francophone. What is a young French-speaking person in the school system in which I grew up managed to see the potential in a young person in a family that believed in bilingualism, that believed in not of losing what they experienced as Acadians because they had to change their last name and over time that no one speaks French over time, no one speaks French in the family. So I grew up with young people and today. They're officially bilingual. And they'll say they're francophones or anglophones, it depends on the context. And maybe some will, you know, will use francophile and some will say the term francophone too limiting and they'll say themselves as a young person I, who speaks French. Because uh, a person's identity, even though the language is most important and it's very close to a person's identity, especially in a minority, minority setting, but it is much more than that. So what is the future of, the, what is the vision of young people when it comes to the future? I can tell you that we hope for Canada, New Brunswick, a Moncton, of North America that is even more bilingual, that in the future we would like a society whereby boxes will be set aside and that we realize that amongst these boxes that we create within our society, there are many more people that are set aside and we can we use everyone's potential in a society and to maximize that potential. It may be utopic for me to say this, but I think we'll have a better world also. Even though not everything is simple, there's potential. There's a great deal of potential. When we succeed to recognize that a person's experience, regardless of their age, that's important, that there's some people that came before us that fought and were, te were trailblazers, and we continue on, even though we build new roads and new paths, a new way to set paths that we do it perhaps differently Maybe we'll fly instead of drive on those roads, or maybe we'll run instead of walk. No matter what we decide to do, uh, youth has a vision, vision of a better future, a little bit like uh, you had when you were the ones speaking for youth. So, concerning linguistic aspects, it'll be a fight, just like the others. Climate change, that is a real challenge. It's a challenge that uh, youth will be embracing, among others, because sometimes when we check the stereotypes, it's easier to get the message across, but environmental challenges are there, linguistics challenges are there. That being said, we are confident that we will see a stronger future and institutions which will be stronger also. So that's what I had to say about uh, the youth's vision of the future. Thank you. <laughs>